director. Just a thank you to our webinar sponsor, TriLink Biotechnologies, for supporting us to deliver these to you. Um, and just to confirm, as we have a lot of questions, that these are being recorded and each one uh, of these webinars will be sent out 24 hours after they finish. Um, as this is our third session, I will keep the introduction short, just allow ample time for uh, Q&As. I'm sure you'll have many of them. So today's uh, last session, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to, is delivered by Dr. Barney Graham as I'm sure many of you know, is the Deputy Director of the Vaccine Research Centre, NIAID NIH, and uh, moderated again by um, Philip Kraus, the Deputy Director, Office of Vaccines for Research and Review, SIVA and the FDA. Welcome back and thank you very much for moderating uh, this series. Um, so just a short note before I hand over, if you haven't been tuning in on our other two webinars, and I hope you have been, um, I'd like to let you know that you can submit questions via the control panel and uh, Phil will um, bring these up during the Q&As after the presentation at time permitting. So that's it for me. Thank you, Phil. Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, it's a really special pleasure to introduce Barney Graham uh, today. I've known Barney for many years and he, he's one of the few people in the world who is really equally comfortable speaking as an expert, both about basic science of uh, uh, that are related to vaccines, whether that's virology, immunology, pathogenesis, as well as clinical trials and, and bridging that gap, which makes his position at the uh, uh, Vaccine Research Center as the uh, deputy director, certainly uh, a place where he can put these talents to very good use. He's also been very intimately involved in the development of one of the leading vaccine candidates for COVID-19. And he's going to tell us uh, what he's uh, learned. Uh, the title of his talk is Rapid COVID-19 Vaccine Development Demonstration of the Prototype Pathogen Approach for Pandemic Preparedness. That's a tongue twister. And so Barney, uh, we, I really look forward to hearing this talk. Go ahead. Okay, well, thank you, Phil. Uh, I'm gonna take you through some of the thoughts we've had over the last few years, but then take you also through the story of what's happened since uh, January 6th this year. And this is just a short list of emerging infections that we are have experienced, at least since I have um, graduated from medical school. Uh, if you want to watch this little image down here, uh, these are airplane traffics, uh, airplanes each day during a single 24 hour period that are going all over the world. And the point I wanna make here is that even HIV was originally a, a, a regional emerging infectious disease, a zoonotic disease that uh, if recognized earlier uh, with surveillance and discovery efforts that were more globalized, uh, maybe it would have also uh, not had to become a, a large pandemic like it did. but. We're going to be faced uh, periodically and repeatedly with challenges from things like hantavirus, abunyavirus, paramyxoviruses, flaviviruses, coronaviruses, uh, alphaviruses, et cetera. And, and uh, there's more than 100 viral families that exist on Earth, but only about 25 of them are known to infect humans. So even though the number of infections that we can track and quantifying humans uh, are going up uh, on a linear basis, the, the number of virus families that infect humans have pl has plateaued. And I wanna come back to this concept of a prototype pathogen approach to better preparedness because between vectors and uh, intermediate animal hosts and the mixing of animal species for flu and migratory bird paths and bats, all these things, we're going to face repeated uh, emerging disease threats. I work at the Vaccine Research Center, which was founded about 20 years ago to uh, make an HIV vaccine. And obviously, we do not have an HIV vaccine yet. We're still working on that. But the technologies that have come from the work on an HIV vaccine have transform a uh, vaccinology. And, and that's one of the other messages of this talk is that we're gonna have repeated emerging infection threats, but we also have a number of new tools that we can use to uh, deal with those. 
So with these technologies, we've also uh, launched projects on influenza, universal influenza vaccines, Ebola vaccines, uh, both vaccines and antibodies, and uh, trying to address some of the old difficult problems that we've had, but also emerging infection problems. And it's more than just a basic research facility, so we're uh, fortunate because we are um, somewhat unique because we have also process development. There's about 100 engineers just north of here in Gaithersburg that do process development. We have another 150 or so people in a pilot plant in Frederick, Maryland. We have a phase one clinical trials clinic in the clinical center. And we have a group that does GLP analysis of our clinical samples. And we have made a variety of different uh, vaccine uh, delivery approaches. I'll talk today about the mRNA, but we've done DNA and viral vectors and virus-like particles, uh, protein-based approaches, and antibodies. Uh, I mentioned that on the Ebola, this MAB114 came from the VRC from Nancy Sullivan's group and was found to be effective at treating Ebola in Eastern Congo during this last year. And there's also antibodies in prophylactic studies in South Africa and uh, in, the, in the Americas to see if it can prevent HIV infection. So we have sent these products all over the world. There's a relatively small group of principal investigators and program heads led by John Moscola, who's uh, pictured here. So, so as I mentioned, uh, this public health burden that we face from emerging and uh, re-emerging diseases, but also for things that have uh, vaccines for unmet needs are still needed. For instance, for respiratory syncytial virus, herpes simplex, HIV, hepatitis C, and, and we could improve licensed vaccines. The mumps vaccine is uh, no longer well matched to its genotype, and so there's things that have been traditionally uh, very effective vaccines that could be updated. But traditional public health approaches, even though they can flatten the curve and, and help and reduce uh, the degree of devastation, they don't really uh, prevent the devastation from something like we're living through now in this pandemic time. And so we uh, want to focus on these new technologies that have really just emerged in the last uh, 10 or 11 years. And they've really changed at least the way we think of conceiving of and starting a vaccine development program from structure-based design that then supports protein engineering and uh, potential for displaying particles on self-assembly nanoparticles uh, to single cell sorting and sequencing that can allow rapid identification of new human antibodies. It can define antibody lineages of interest uh, that are associated with protection that can become new molecular targets of a vaccine development program. And it can analyze single cell responses to vaccines that give you a lot more information than we used to get just from our ELISA and NUD assays. At the same time, there's been uh, major advances in how to uh, get into the manufacturing of products for vaccinology. And uh, between rapid DNA synthesis and some of these uh, platform technologies and ability to rapidly engineer new cell lines, uh, things are, are much different. So you have a combination of both uh, precision and speed that have evolved over these last 10 years that give us the tools to, to be better prepared, but also to respond more quickly to the outbreaks. So we think that, um, I don't know how to get rid of this thing, but we think that um, these new technologies that I've just mentioned uh, can help change vaccinology from more of an iterative, empirical, uh, sequential science and biology to more of an engineering that's modular and, and maybe more predictable and uh, controllable. So one of these uh, concepts is synthetic vaccinology, and it's been uh, discussed by many people, Phil Dormitzer, for instance, and this just means that if you have a sequence uh, that can be defined anywhere of a pathogen, 
it can be digitally transferred to places where uh, heuristic knowledge can allow you to uh, make vaccine targets, develop uh, synthetically the key reagents, including monoclonal antibodies, to rapidly get into a vaccine development program within weeks instead of waiting for virus isolation and recovery, and, and which often takes uh, months or years to, to get into full swing. These platform uh, technologies, uh, I'm just going to mention this one example of DNA, which we have made at the VRC. We can control these timelines ourselves. So beginning with SARS in 2003, then avian flu, then the pandemic flu in 2009 to Zika, we could reduce the timeline from the sequence selected from to first in human injection in a phase one from 20 months down to 100 days. And with some of the newer technologies, even like uh, mRNA, uh, you can get it down below uh, 60 days. So these rapid approaches with the synthetic and precise uh, precision approaches, I think, uh, have made everything different. So now I'm going to uh, go back to the idea of this uh, prototype pathogen. So among uh, many of our envelope viruses use what we call a class one fusion protein for entry into cells. That is uh, illustrated at the bottom. They have similar types of motifs. They have endoproteolytic cleavage, or fusion peptide, and heptad repeats that allow a big rearrangement to occur that pulls the membranes together for a membrane fusion and virus entry. And even though the domain structures are somewhat different, uh, for instance, uh, coronavirus has different types of domains than a paramyx or a pneumovirus, and the shapes of these molecules are quite different, they still operate in similar ways. And, and there's similar principles that you can take not just across a vaccine, a virus family, but across uh, uh, this, these broader categories of entry mechanisms. So uh, for me, at least, this started with RSV back about eight years ago when we were working toward just trying to understand the prefusion structure of the F glycoprotein on RSV, which is the main uh, antigenic target for vaccine development for RSV. And uh, what we finally understood was that this uh, prefusion form of the molecule, when it rearranges, and it rearranges spontaneously, can turn into this molecule. And this molecule over the years has been used in vaccine trials and typically can only boost neutralizing antibody activity uh, by about two to three fold. And so it is not sufficient to give you many months uh, in a maternal immunization setting, for instance. But if you stay with this prefusion form with just a few mutations uh, C-terminal trimerization domain, you now are able to boost with a single dose uh, neutralizing activity up, up to 14 or 15 or 16 fold. And that now gives you uh, several months of protection in a maternal immunization type setting. So these kinds of principles have been applied now to multiple parainfluenza viruses. I'm showing you here some other paramyxoviruses like the measles F protein can now be stabilized in this prefusion versus the post-fusion form and is much more immunogenic and generates new activity here, but not very well here. Uh, it's been done for the mumps F protein. Again, the pre-F is much more immunogenic than the post-F, and even for Nipah and other uh, types of paramyxoviruses, we can now stabilize the F in the pre-fusion form, avoiding the post-fusion form that now has lost all the neutralization-sensitive surfaces, and uh, even start using these uh, pieces now to engineer uh, more interesting types of antigens, which would include the pre-fusion F and the G uh, like a protein of NEPA, so you can create more complex antigenic uh, mixes. So for coronaviruses, which are also use a class one fusion protein, they have been 
somewhat understudied over the years and uh, under uh, appreciated, even though they cause up to 30% of, uh, of our common cold syndromes. And we have four endemic coronaviruses, two beta coronaviruses in the A-clade and two alpha coronaviruses that circulate every season in uh, every winter season in humans. And uh, but now over the last 20 years, we've had three new emergent uh, uh, coronaviruses, uh, beta coronaviruses, two in the B clade and the MERS and the uh, uh, C clade uh, that I think have finally gotten everyone's attention uh, fully. Uh, SARS came, uh, the first SARS-1 came in 2002 and three, and then the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, came uh, around 2012. And uh, the first SARS had um, clinical syndrome similar to what we're seeing now with the SARS-2, an incubation period of two to 10 days. It starts with a fever and chills and then ends up with respiratory sim symptoms. And uh, in, the, in SARS-1, it actually had a higher uh, serious illness rate and mortality. And, but there were some things about uh, SARS that were interesting. And uh, for instance, this idea of super spreading, uh, we think that the uh, R0 or the R sub zero value for this new SARS-2 is someplace between two and four, a little, a little higher than maybe influenza, but just like uh, MERS, this happened in MERS as well, the first SARS had incidences, instances of super spreading where, for instance, in this little outbreak cluster, all of these cases were really caused by these four individuals. And other people may not have infected anyone or maybe one or two people. So super spreading is something we haven't uh, understood yet. Uh, that, that would also help uh, in the time going forward. So SARS, fortunately, after starting in uh, Guangzhou uh, province uh, near Hong Kong and then going from Hong Kong around the world, uh, mostly by air travel, uh, after a few months, uh, really did disappear and only ended up causing 8,000 cases, but uh, almost, you know, 700, more than 700 deaths. So it did not propagate, it did not sustain itself like this virus seems to be doing uh, in, a, in a more efficient way from person to person. Then the MERS coronavirus came uh, in 2012 and it was probably a bat derived virus that had a camel intermediate host. And even though there have been a few uh, instances where it would go, for instance, in South Korea and cause an outbreak of more than 180 people from just three super spreaders. But it's mostly stayed regional in the Middle East where it occasionally goes from a camel to a human and then sometimes small outbreaks occur in, in medical facilities. And, and we're very fortunate that MERS was not more contagious than it was because it had a mortality rate of almost uh, 40%. So these two viruses seem to be uh, focused in the lower respiratory tract, but the new virus uh, clearly uh, is able to replicate and shed from the upper respiratory tract, making it much more uh, contagious. So even though uh, what was started after SARS in 2003 wasn't really completed, after MERS came, it was clear uh, of several groups that we needed a, a, an approach to coronaviruses that would be more robust because it was likely to happen again. And so using the same approach that we did for RSV, uh, we looked at the spike protein. We were lucky to find that the HKU1 spike was inherently more stable than the other ones and allowed us in collaboration with Jason McClellan and Andrew Ward's lab at Scripps to get a cryo-EM structure uh, of the HKU1 spike. And once we had that, you could identify uh, places like at the top of this central helix where you could put two proline mutations, for instance, to interrupt the refolding of these helices to make the heptad repeat. 
that's required for the entry process. So you could largely stabilize the, the protein just by putting these two prolines in this one place. And fortunately, that analogous uh, two proline mutation could also work for MERS and SARS, which allowed us to solve those structures. But maybe more importantly, um, uh, even than keeping it in this prefusion form where you preserve the neutralization sensitive epitopes, you also significantly increase expression levels above wild type uh, sequences. So the wild type sequences down here, the mutated 2P sequence uh, has up to 50 fold better expression, uh, for instance, in MERS. And so uh, you maintain this prefusion uh, con configuration, but also improve expression. And so I mentioned that uh, the structures are now available for MERS spike and SARS spike. Uh, we've also solved structures for the alpha virus 229E uh, and the veterinary uh, coronavirus PDV and the other beta coronavirus OC43 and even some SARS-like uh, viruses in bats that are thought to have potential for uh, emergence uh, as, as a SARS-like virus. So we know a lot now about the spike protein. Uh, we now also know about its immunogenicity compared to a monomeric S1 uh, protein uh, to the wild type protein compared to these uh, stabilized prefusion spike. You can see you have a dose sparing at very low doses, you maintain good uh, neutralizing activity against homologous virus, but also against uh, a range of virus isolates uh, of MERS that uh, the, the stabilized spike is more immunogenic uh, as a protein vaccine than uh, the wild type. And we know that at relatively low doses, this uh, stabilized spike can protect uh, mice that are uh, have a DPP4 knock-in uh, from Ralph Berig's lab and, and uh, prevent lethal disease and prevent even weight loss. So we know that the immunity that spike can be protective. We also started uh, in 2016 or 17, a collaboration with Moderna because we're interested in this concept of pandemic preparedness. They have this rapid manufacturing platform and um, and we had antigen designs that we were interested in. And so we started working with them on mRNA versions of the MERS spike and showed that again, with the stabilized version of spike, you have dose sparing and at even 16 nanogram doses in mice, you can generate decent levels of neutralizing activity that are associated with a protection, at least in that mouse model. So, we had the information that homologous uh, mutations of these two prolines at the top of the central helix could stabilize spike. We knew that the stabilized spike were uh, trimers were more Im immunogenic and protective than other versions of the spike. And we thought it could be a general solution for beta coronavirus vaccine design. So, you know, when would we ever have a chance to use this again? Uh, this is a chart that comes from uh, a paper by Dr. Drosten and adapted from some a slide that Ralph Berry had made. And if you look at the uh, endemic coronaviruses here or the pandemic uh, zoonotic coronaviruses here, uh, you see that it looks like from genetic uh, uh, determination. Uh, some of them come from bats, some of them come from rodents, through different types of intermediate animal hosts, uh, but eventually uh, get into humans. And it looks like this has had been happening over several hundred years. This uh, alpha coronaviruses uh, came 500 or 300 years ago. The beta coronaviruses, this OC43 may have been the cause of that 1890 epidemic that, or pandemic that uh, was uh, uh, documented. And HKU1 was only discovered about uh, 15 years ago, but it's probably been around uh, for a few decades. So the 
the question is then, you know, when would the next one happen? And then at the end of December, we heard of this outbreak in, uh, that was reported by Chinese scientists. And uh, around the 6th of January, there were rumors that it was a SARS-like coronavirus. So because of our work with Moderna previously, we uh, started talking about what we would do if we got a sequence and, and how would we, would we approach this because it looked like a potential threat. And so on uh, January 10th, uh, in the evening, the Chinese uh, scientists posted the sequences from the first six uh, viruses that they isolated. And on the 11th, on Saturday the 11th, we ordered sequences that would uh, produce a, what we thought would be a stabilized spike protein. And fortunately, it was a stabilized spike protein, and, and it allowed us, in collaboration with Jason McClellan's lab, uh, to get a cryo-EM structure of this uh, SARS-2 uh, spike protein uh, relatively quick, just in, within a few weeks. And so we knew that uh, we didn't have any antibody reagents, but we knew that we had a good protein because we could see the structure of the protein. And we could also document it on lower resolution uh, electron microscopy, which is also quite different than what you could do 10 years ago. So the uh, evolution of electron microscopy technologies has really uh, made all of this uh, quite different. And uh, we know, uh, knew very quickly, Vincent Munster and others published this within days, that this uh, new spike protein on SARS-2 also use the uh, human ACE2 or angiotensin tension converting enzyme receptor 2 uh, that the first SARS used. And so there were some reagents already in cell lines and mice, even transgenic mice, that had the ACE2 receptor from uh, 15 years ago. And we know that if we can block this interaction of the spike with the ACE2, uh, that we could probably prevent a viral entry and interrupt uh, infection. And so because of our work in MERS, uh, we had mapped uh, neutralizing antibody domains. There's at least two on the end terminal domain, one coming from the top, one coming from the side. We know there's at least three competition groups for neutralizing antibodies on the RBD, one that really is only exposed when this RBD flips up. And this, uh, the RBD on this protomer you see wraps around or weaves around the NTD from the adjacent protomer, but it cannot access its receptor unless it flips up. So one of the thoughts of how this works is you can see one or two or three up position RBDs. And when that happens, the S1 probably uh, opens up or peels away to allow the S2 fusion machinery to interact with the cell and, and, and initiate entry. So if you can interrupt this process, uh, you can uh, neutralize the virus. So because of this other work on structures and antibody mapping and structural stabilization, uh, we were ready uh, to order and Moderna was willing to take a risk of GMP manufacturing just based on our prior experience with MERS and and uh, and the the degree of uh, what what was at stake with this potential new pandemic and so um, within three days a sequence was decided on a few other uh, modifications were considered so a sequence was started into GMP manufacturing on. January 14th, and uh, within 38 days, Moderna was able to deliver uh, a vial GMP product to start a clinical trial. And this is the first time I've ever seen uh, where the manufacturing process uh, outpaced the clinical uh, development process to get IRB approvals and to uh, the regulatory process to file and uh, get INDs back. And so uh, 24 days later, the phase one clinical trial started on, on March 16th. And, and so uh, along the way, we were able to make protein uh, that allowed us to, to look for cross-reactive uh, antibodies from the original first SARS. It allowed us to solve the structure and allowed us to immunize mice and, and uh, determine that this product was immunogenic. 
And so uh, with all that and with the um, uh, really collaboration of the regulatory agencies, um, a D, an IND was submitted and, and very rapidly approved with uh, conditions to allow this uh, safe to proceed and, and getting into the clinical trial. So I, this is fast, but it may not be fast enough. And it actually could have been faster by about three weeks if we had finished the mRNA MERS vaccine project. Because if we had already had the MERS spike mRNA through a phase one clinical trial with safety data and uh, the other kind of things you need to really uh, you know, prove that it's safe enough to advance, uh, we probably could have shaved a few weeks off of this, and weeks are going to matter uh, in this type of pandemic setting if you want to have products available before the next winter uh, season. And compared to other vaccine tr trials where we thought we had uh, made a pretty fast DNA for Zika uh, from sequence selection to phase one in 100 days, but there was also three or four months of time that it took to decide which DNA sequence to select. So this process where we really knew uh, what could be done to, to design the spike antigen ahead of time uh, was about 130 or 40 days faster than what we thought was about as fast as you could go. So. I think these new tools that are available do make it possible to consider how best to prepare and how best to respond quickly in a, in a pandemic setting. Now, the mRNA is not the only vaccine being developed, and WHO actually has a slide with 51 different vaccines being uh, going into preclinical and clinical testing. Uh, the one I'm talking about here is in phase one. It's been in phase one now for almost four weeks. So the boost will happen next Monday and we'll start being able to evaluate immunogenicity. There was a, a recombinant ad five uh, vector that was started in China about the same time. And uh, Inovio, a DNA product, uh, was started apparently in clinical trials a day or two ago. The main reason I'm showing this with these circled is that there's vaccines in almost every category with live attenuated viral vectors, nucleic acid and subunit approaches. And the large pharmaceutical companies are involved in each one of these categories. And I'm, I don't want to uh, de-emphasize any other group's product, but the point is, is that there are large pharma groups in all of these categories. So I think it it helps uh, have some confidence that there will be um, things, you know, if the mRNA does or doesn't work, there'll be other things coming along with pretty well-established groups. And, and uh, the other uh, product that's coming very soon, apparently, is the uh, Oxford product that is a chimp ad, uh, adenovector. And so, between uh, subunit proteins and new ad vectors or pox vectors and other nucleic acids and recombinant proteins, I think within uh, you know a year or at least several months, there will be uh, a number of options for vaccination. So I just want to end with a couple of comments on this idea of prototype uh, vaccine uh, preparedness and. You've heard about the rapid manufacturing approaches. The problem with rapid manufacturing is if you don't deliver the right antigen rapidly, it still is not going to work. And so the WHO and CEPI organizations have made pri priority pathogen lists, but we think it requires a more systematic and gl global uh, review of what should be prepared for and that all 25 virus families that have infected people before should be examined, and at least one prototype within each group should be uh, taken through phase one clinical trials. And so um, this is a large but doable project. Uh, you know, we already have licensed products for 13 viral families uh, that I'm talking about, and and there's 12 viral families that don't have uh, licensed vaccines uh, 
that could be a prototype or example. And and uh, so we think that uh, for each of these 25 or maybe 30, if you count some of the unique genera, that you should identify structures, monoclonal antibodies, animal uh, models, and you know, degree of genetic variability and replication patterns so you can make antivirals. And so that you should take these products for prototype pathogens within each of these groups through a phase one clinical trial and have something on the shelf in case something happens. And, and for these other 80 to 120 viruses that are within these families that may be... Uh, uh, less likely to emerge, but still possible, we should uh, work through the, the structures and the antibodies and the animal uh, model concepts and at least take something through an animal model development. This is large, but it's doable. Uh, and I think there needs to be more public support for this kind of uh, activity. And you could organize them. Uh, we, I think of them as uh, entry mechanisms. So you could organize them by class one fusion proteins, class two fusion proteins, class three, and non-envelope viruses. And and if you had investigators really focused in on the generalizable concepts within these uh, project areas, and also had them paired with core groups that had these kinds of capacities, then you could work through this kind of uh, uh, a project, we think, within a 10 to 20 year period. And then you can apply these tools for antigen design, animal model development, analysis, and uh, delivery. And these are only going to proliferate into even more creative ways uh, of vaccinating people. So. Uh, I'm going to end by just saying I think this is doable, and I think we should use these new technologies to, to solve our longstanding problems and new emerging problems. We should combine the precision approach with the uh, modular engineering approach and, uh, and rapid platform manufacturing to uh, be better prepared for future uh, pandemics. I just want to thank uh, my group that I work with every day, especially our small coronavirus team that's been plugging away at this for the last seven years. Kazmikia Corbett is, leads that group with uh, Olu Abiona and Jeff Hutchinson. Uh, other uh, groups that John Moscola directs, uh, uh, Ling Shu Wang, uh, Yi Zhang, and Wing Pu. Kong have also been very involved in this effort. And of course, Jason McClellan, who I've worked with for uh, almost 10 years now, um, who's now at UT Austin, has been very involved in uh, many of these concepts. And I, I'll, this will be my last slide. I'm going to end with all these uh, government agencies and all the industry groups and nonprofit groups and academic groups that have uh, supported this work. Uh, uh, the world's response to this problem, I think, is more organized than it was to Zika. And that was much more organized than it was to Ebola in 2014. And so I think we're getting better. And, and it's remarkable to me how many different groups and agencies have come together around um, uh, trying to solve this problem. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Barney. That uh, uh, really uh, was a tour de force and went through a lot of amazing science and really highlighted, I don't think we can say it's just luck, but the incredible thoughtfulness of uh, being prepared with uh, all of these studies uh, with MERS that then allowed some rapid extrapolation to the SARS-CoV-2 problem. Um, as, as you were describing your proposed research agenda for the next 10 to 20 years, uh, it's obviously very ambitious. How much of that do you think the VRC can take on? Or, 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 or what, what, what scale is that really going to require? Uh, who needs to do this? Well, I think the VRC can take on a couple of those, but uh, this is much larger than the VRC. And I, you know, there's a, uh, Oxford has a group that, and capacity to at least go through phase one development. CEPI is now organized to take investigators through uh, discovery and phase one development. 
Uh, we need more of those kinds of groups around the world who can uh, control their own manufacturing and at least early process development that can get through some of these uh, early projects. The, the big problem we have is that um, how do you then do the advanced development? Because, uh, you know, it's very hard to, as a commercial entity who has to be profitable to stay in business, it's very hard to invest in something that may not ever be needed. So this is going to require public funding in a way that we haven't really conceived of before. So in my opinion, we need more groups like CEPI and Oxford and the VRC, and we need another set of public entities that can do advanced development, at least to get products on the shelf ahead of time and be ready with uh, to respond to some of these new kinds of uh, uh, when we get a new emerging uh, problem. So you've, of course, described many different vaccine technologies, and, and some of them may be more versus less applicable to different pathogens on this list. So that adds, perhaps, to the complexity of the problem. Um, as uh, uh, one, of, one of the questions I've seen here, and it sort of uh, follows on what you've just said, is if one thinks about a global pandemic like uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, you one might see oneself needing billions of doses of vaccine in very short order. Uh, can you talk about the adaptability of the different platforms that you've discussed uh, and, and their ability to, to actually deliver on that kind of potential need? And of course, you can also uh, discuss that for the mRNA platform that you're using. Right. So I think um, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I, I think that I understand uh, that until about 60 or 70 percent of our population is immune to this virus, either through infection or vaccination, we're probably going to continue to suffer uh, in this pandemic. And it'll it'll take that level of immunity to turn it into what may become a an endemic seasonal coronavirus uh, like some of the others that we have. And so the question is, can we get 60 or 70 percent of the 8 billion people on Earth immunized with the vaccine so they don't have to be infected, which means we need five or six billion doses at least, right? So there's technologies that are uh, have been established and are uh, well understood, like making subunit proteins in yeast or something like that, where we know that billions of doses could probably be prepared. Uh, subunit proteins made in mammalian cell culture, uh, I think you could imagine that hundreds of millions at least of doses could be prepared. mRNA, mRNA has never been a licensed product, and so it has never really been forced to scale up. But right now, there's a lot of effort on, on trying to get this scaled up to a point and uh, establish supply chains that could allow at least making tens of millions of doses per month that would, would, uh, would satisfy a lot of the needs. And especially if there were multiple um, groups contributing to that, there's at least three or four mRNA companies uh, in this. And so if that particular approach works, you could imagine that that together, they could be making 30, 40 million uh, uh, regimens per month, and, and which, would, would, which would help a lot with that vaccination process. So, you know, I, I think some things that could be scaled up to billions of doses are going to take longer to um, to, to get ready and things that might be ready faster may take longer to scale up. So I think it's going to all be a big balance. Okay, a lot of really good questions. And so I'm going to try to group the, some of these. Um, uh, a, a number of questions relate to issues surrounding vaccine safety. The, the question of whether as you accelerate vaccine development and efficacy, uh, uh, can you uh, 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 can you achieve an equal understanding of safety? Uh, questions about enhanced disease, specific with coronavirus vaccines, and so forth. So let me just put that safety out there as an issue, which perhaps you can uh, um, describe uh, uh, how you see vaccine safety. 
both in the context of your pandemic plan and as well as then uh, in the context of the specific uh, vaccine, which uh, obviously has already advanced into clinical trials, where uh, uh, um, at least uh, to go by one of the questions we received in one of the previous webinars, some people are concerned about uh, um, about about whether maybe we're moving too fast. Okay, well, I think that's a very good question. Um, I am a clinician. Uh, that's how I started, and I uh, have started clinical programs and run more than a hundred clinical trials. And for me, the most important thing as a vaccine developer is to make sure no one gets hurt. And it's uh, we're immunizing otherwise healthy people, and we have to we have a very high bar for safety. So. I think I'll tell you how I think about these uh, possibilities or, or uh, concerns about vaccine enhancement, but uh, I think you should know that everyone is very concerned about uh, maintaining safety, but also trying to, uh, to go fast because the stakes are pretty high. So there are two major uh, phenomenon uh, that have been uh, potentially linked to coronavirus is all of it has been in animal models. None of it has been in humans. Uh, one is the possibility for antibody dependent enhancement. Uh, uh, thinking in the same way that uh, maybe you would think about a severe dengue uh, uh, infection on a second serotype or uh, you know, from prior immunization of naive subjects that the second infection sometimes is worse. It goes up from maybe one and a half percent of severe disease up to two and a half to three percent of people getting severe disease. So it's not a universal phenomenon. It's, it happens in a few individuals and I, ADE is maybe the back, background of that, but it's, it's controversial. There was uh, a coronavirus in cats, feline infectious peritonitis virus that was shown in the 80s and 90s to have an ADE syndrome where uh, the FC gamma R re uh, receptor binding by the antibody that did not neutralize the virus increased replication in macrophages. This is a virus that's already macrophage tropic. It is a systemic infection that causes a vasculitis-like syndrome. And so in that setting of macrophage tropism, there was an antibody-dependent enhancement with antibodies that had poor neutralizing activity. And so that is a concern. I think it's less of a concern for respiratory coronaviruses or GI coronaviruses where the tropism is for epithelial cells, especially ciliated epithelium in the lower airways and uh, type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes. Uh, this is not a virus that's known to infect um, myeloid cells very well. Um, so if uh, antibody can change tropism into macrophage tropism, it could possibly lead to something like that. And those kind of questions are going to be asked with the passive antibody experiments in animal models. But I, I don't have a lot of concern for ADE, even though we uh, are going to study it very intensively. There's another phenomenon that was more similar to what happened with respiratory syncytial virus and measles virus back in the 1960s, where tween ether or formal and inactivated virus, whole virus vaccines were given in alum. And then in RSV, in the very youngest age cohort of young infants who got immunized and then infected, you got an enhancement of severity and hospitalization and even a couple of deaths in the young infants who had this uh, vaccine. And this vaccine was um, inactivated in a way that flipped the F protein into the non-functional position. We know that now, and uh, it created an antibody response that had a high binding uh, and low neutralization uh, uh, properties. And so, it had a lot of antibody, and when you meet a large viral load, there was evidence that immune complexes were formed and precipitated and activated complement in the small airways of those children who died. So there was an immune complex antibody problem and with antibody that had poor functional activity. 
There was also a T-cell problem because immunizing with that protein-based product in alum grown in cell culture, um, it led to uh, an eosinophilic uh, infiltrate in lung after challenge. And it also, uh, you know, elicited uh, type 2 cytokines. So you've got a lot of mucus formation in the airways. You've got uh, eosinophilia and you've got airway hypersensitivity uh, from some of the IL-13 effects. And it also, those kind of cytokines also inhibit CD8 T cell function, which is not something you want to do. So there was a T cell problem and an antibody problem. Both of those uh, kinds of problems have been intensively studied for RSV over the years and uh, less so for measles, but, but still the syndrome is, is similar, just a difference in timing. And the FDA has spent a lot of time and the EMA has spent a lot of time on defining how new RSV vaccines can get through this uh, regulatory challenge and to find, you know, the kind of properties you might need to show in order to get into naive infants again. So there is quite a bit of background, I think, on how to navigate this regulatory process and, and quite a bit of understanding of what kind of experiments need to be done. You need to immunize with diminishing doses and uh, where breakthrough infection happens, evaluate the pathology, ev evaluate the cytokine patterns and make sure your antigen uh, construct itself has a high neutralizing uh, potency and, and relative to its binding potency. So I'll, I'll stop there. I probably explained that too long, but uh, it is a complicated problem. Definitely complex. Uh, and I'll definitely agree with you also is that uh, everybody who's involved in the development of these vaccines, including regulators around the world, are, are concerned about this and want to make sure that vaccines are carefully evaluated uh, for this, uh, uh, while, of course, also, uh, uh, and they do this by, by looking at all of the available data and, and really coming up with a clear assessment of the likelihood of any problems. And, of course, keep looking at new data as they come in. Uh, th there are a number of questions about sort of related to vaccine efficacy, and I'll sort of try and... Uh, them together. Number one is sort of what kind of immune response do we even need for efficacy? Do we really know what are the the uh, uh, the protective antigens uh, and epitopes? Uh, do we know uh, um, whether cell mediated immunity is important, um, uh, uh, or do we even know for sure that uh, humans are capable of uh, reasonable uh, protective immunity against uh, this virus that, that lasts more than a fairly short period of time? Uh, those are all good questions, and they're all being addressed, um, you know, as fast as can be expected. But I think based on what we know about the endemic coronaviruses and influenza and RSV and other respiratory viruses, uh, sometimes they don't create solid immunity from natural infection. And so you may even be able to be reinfected in the upper airway, but over time you do develop uh, immunity in the lower airway, and, and that is what we need to prevent really severe uh, lower airway disease and, and mortality. And a lot of that protection is associated with neutralizing antibody uh, type of responses. And I think it's always good to have CD8 T cell responses to rapidly clear the virus infected cells. Those are probably best if they're tissue resident CD8s which is a little hard to induce with parenteral vaccination. But you know, one of the reasons we like the mRNA approach is because it does induce both CD8 T cells and Th1 CD4 T cells. And uh, if we make the protein in the right way, which I think we are, uh, we'll make good neutralizing antibody responses. So you get all those elements uh, with an mRNA approach. Uh, it's, it's more complicated uh, talking about protein approaches, even though I think protein approaches really are needed because it's one of the things we know how to scale. And I think we can make good protein that would have good neutralizing activity, but those protein uh, delivery systems don't induce CD8. So you wouldn't have that element. And, uh, you know, the, the staging of this is, is uh, going to be, have to be highly orchestrated because even though 
there's a few healthy adults with large airways who are being put at some risk during this initial phase one trial, uh, fully informed, but uh, agree that they have some level of risk. And uh, But before we move into larger studies, there will be uh, animal data for efficacy, for pathology, for cytokines. Before we go into larger scale trials, there'll be monkey studies with uh, you know, positive controls for the enhancement and uh, efficacy data and a lot of immunology data. And there'll be early human immunology data to support the advancement. So each of these steps is going to be sort of interlocking as, as the regulators have to help us make decisions on whether we can safely proceed. And, and um, you know, we're also going to be learning more about efficacy. Sometimes you don't really know if something, how, how well something's going to work until, until you can get into a randomized control trial. Sure, uh, Barney, uh, actually, great, great and, and complete answer. You, you sort of teased at the results of some of your initial animal immunogenicity studies. You said that you had them. And there are a number of questions about, well, how good are the immune responses? Is the stabilized domain uh, uh, in uh, uh, this virus really yielding uh, the kind of immune responses you're also getting with your MERS constructs? In other words, how, how well does it do, do those studies make it appear that this is actually going to work? Well, um you know, this is really something that Moderna has to tell people. Uh, I can't really tell people um, uh, be, for legal reasons, actually. But, um, you know, I'm, I am was relatively confident, at least at the level of mice, that the MERS mRNA approach was working effectively. We could, we can block virus replication. And I'm, you know, I'm, cautiously optimistic that we're going to have similar results with uh, this new uh, product. And so we'll just have to see. There's going to be data coming out over the next uh, few weeks that will help us know this uh, better. So uh, you won't have to wait too much longer. So uh, uh, I'm just going to ask you one last question here because we do have to pull, uh, finish this up at noon uh, today. Um, and, and that is, uh, um, uh, tell me what, what you think about methods of evaluating efficacy of these vaccines. And, 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 and of course, uh, there's been uh, 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 editorials uh, and, and articles, I think, uh, even in the New York Times, su suggesting the possibility of using human challenge models for this virus. Do you think that's realistic? And, uh, uh, um, and you know, please give your thoughts on that. Okay. Well, the way I think about it is we have to do two things. We have to show that it's efficacious and we have to show that it avoids some of the safety signals that we're worried about. And so you can do that with both immunogenicity readouts in either humans or animals. And you can do that with challenge readouts in animals. And I guess you could consider challenge readouts in humans. Um, I think it's going to take some time to find a live attenuated virus that could safely be given to adults. Uh, it may take longer than getting a vaccine into a randomized controlled trial in the field. And if there's still virus infections going around, I, you may be able to get a quicker answer in the field than you can by finding a, a perfectly attenuated live virus. Although, Barney, I think some who are proposing this are suggesting to use a wild-type virus, but to use uh, uh, participants in the study who are younger and not at high risk for getting severe disease. Yeah. Um, I admire those people, and I, I think it's something that we should consider, but uh, it's easier to do that in a system like influenza where you have an antiviral that you could use if needed or if you at least had a monoclonal antibody or plasma therapy, it would be nice to have that if needed because the mortality in this disease is not only exclusively to old people. So you, th this would have some risk associated with it. And the other, um, the other small comment I'll make on this is that um, 
mostly what we're trying to do, our major objective biologically with the vaccine is to prevent disease, which is mostly lower airway infection and lower airway pathology. Most of the human challenge models are primarily studying upper airway uh, virus replication and disease. And so uh, you may not entirely, uh, even in a failed human challenge, you may have a vaccine that could protect lower airway. And so uh, there, there's caveats to the human challenge and there's great advantages. If we had a, a virus that could be safely used and we could run through a lot of different vaccine concepts very quickly um, if we did have a human challenge uh, system set up. Uh, thank you very, very much, Barney. We'll stop there because it is noon. We didn't get to all the questions, but we did get to quite a few of them. This has been an absolutely fantastic uh, summary of really important work. And I think I can speak for everyone who's listening to say that we really wish you great luck and, and speed in, in getting uh, this vaccine evaluated uh, with the hope, obviously, that it will uh, actually end up being successful and can find its way to people who need it as quickly as possible. So it's really been a great pleasure moderating this session, Barney. Uh, you've been a, a terrific uh, speaker. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, Wing, were there any words you wanted to say finally about uh, uh, upcoming conferences or anything like that that the audience yes. might be interested in? <laughs> no words of wisdom like you both, but um, obviously thanking everyone for their time um, and their contribution to the Q&As um, over this past week. Um, uh, if you can join us again next month, or we have our, our second series and uh, we'll, you'll be hearing from the active vaccine developers themselves on their progress. Uh, and if you could add this tentatively uh, for the week of the 11th of May, um, and I will send over more details shortly once all of that is confirmed. Um, just to confirm as well, even though I said it at the, at the beginning, I think some people join us a bit late, um, that these webinars are recorded uh, and always shared a day after the web webinar has been run. So it'll be tomorrow for today's one. Um, so, you know, just a final thank you for all of our speakers this week, um, you know, and Barney and, and of course, to Phil uh, for moderating these and, and doing such a good job on that. And uh, and also to our, of course, our webinar sponsor, Trilink uh, Biotechnologies as well. So um, I wish everyone and uh, please stay safe and uh, I hope to speak to you all very soon. Uh, thanks again. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be involved with these, and I think uh, all of the attendees greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity to hear from such stellar, stellar speakers. So thanks, and uh, look forward to interacting with all of you in some other venue some other time. Uh, and as Wayne says, stay safe. Bye-bye. Uh, Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.